Hi everyone, welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at First Baptist in Berlin, New York. <clears throat> really glad you've joined us as we continue in this series entitled Discerning Truth. Tonight I want to talk about really what it, what it means, what is discernment, to find discernment and why is it so important. But let's begin with a word of prayer together. Thank you, Father, for your precious word. And we are asking for your guidance, for your uh, discernment upon the things we look at in the word tonight. Lord, help us to be uh, receptive of truth and, uh, and to be led by your spirit in such a way as we look in your word that we can know the truth. And we know that's the promises. That's what sets us free in our lives. And we thank you for that. So we ask that your blessing be upon the things we say tonight, and we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <clears throat> what do we mean by discernment? Why is it important? Well, in its simplest definition, discernment is really nothing more than an ability to decide between truth and error and right and wrong. It's, it's the process of making careful distinctions and thinking about truth. In other words, the ability to think with discernment is really some synonymous with the ability to think biblically. We hear a lot of things today, and a lot of uh, people who are uh, have somewhat um, great, um, uh, get a lot of press or whatever you want to say, uh, can say some pretty crazy things. And we hear people talking about your truth and my truth, and well, wait a minute, you know, what does that mean? And uh, isn't there some type of an absolute truth here? And that's why we really need discernment in every area of our life. I want us to begin with this. I think it's an important principle to establish that every believer has a responsibility to be discerning. Uh, yes, pastors and teachers definitely must. And it's a great it's a, a responsibility to teach the Word of God. We have this responsibility to be discerning as we study and as we share the, the things we've learned with others. But that does not mean that only the pastor or the teacher or others in leadership positions, they're not the only ones responsible for being discerning. Every believer needs this in their life. The scripture says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. Test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. It's a very important uh, principle to follow. Apostle John issued a very similar warning in 1 John chapter 4, verse number 1. He said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Some somehow we have developed in our culture, and even among many Christians, the idea that it is it's wrong to question another person's beliefs. That's just wrong, and uh, that's, once again, that's their truth, and we have a different truth, but that doesn't make sense. It really, it really doesn't. In fact, it's a very dangerous thing uh, to take everything at face value, to everything as someone comes along and says a particular thing, and they say, well, okay, that must be true because you said it. Uh, we know that doesn't work, and yet so many times we... we are doing that, especially in the areas of biblical thought. Maybe that misconception, at least in many people's lives, might be influenced by postmodernism, which basically denies the idea of absolute truth. There are no absolutes. By the way, that statement is an absolute statement in the first place, but um, there are many people who kind of give credence to that. Um, sometimes uh, we might approach it this way, the idea of thinking... We should never question anything anyone says because we don't want to appear offensive. Or we may simply be afraid to take a stand for the truth. Or we may not understand things well enough to even to know the difference. That becomes very dangerous. But according to the scripture, discernment is not optional for a believer. It is absolutely essential. See, discernment affects every area of our life. One very important principle we must all learn is that the ability to exercise discernment or the lack of that ability is going to affect everything that we do. A failure to distinguish between truth and error will leave the Christian subject to all types of false teaching. How do we know what is true, what is false, if we don't have any discernment? And false teaching then leads to an unbiblical mindset, which results... If we're a believer in this unfruitful and disobedient living, 
for those who are without Christ, it will, in many cases, keep them blinded to truth because they are buying into error that they have heard and they have no discernment about it. And as we look at last week, uh, the idea of the sufficiency of God's word, God has given us his word, which is sufficient for everything we need. And it is the final authority in everything that we do. <clears throat> There's an old hymn that's entitled, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. And I was thinking of that song. I looked up the, the song. The third verse is really interesting. It says, My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God, salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. So really the song is expressing that, the sufficiency of the word of God. That is where the authority is. That is where we get discernment. But unfortunately, discernment is an area where many believers stumble. They really have a hard time. They will exhibit uh, very little ability to measure things which are taught in the Scripture uh, or things that they are taught and be able to compare those to things which are taught in the Scripture. The infallible standard, of course, is God's Word. And then they unwittingly begin to engage in all kinds of unbiblical decision-making, making very poor decisions because of a lack of discernment or their actual behavior, uh, belief system. Basically, they're not armed to take a decidedly biblical stand against the onslaught of unbiblical thinking and the attitudes that face them. We're constantly going to hear things and um, see things and, and be taught different things. We need to have a standard by which to measure everything that we hear and that we see. The sermon intersects the Christian life at every point. You can't get away from it. And God's Word provides us with this discernment that we need about every issue. It really does. Paul speaks to this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He says, Do not be conformed to this world. Otherwise, don't compromise in your Christian walk. Don't just do things because that's what everybody else is doing. Don't be conformed. Don't be squeezed, one uh, translator says. Don't be squeezed into the mold of the world. That's not what God intends for us. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Our minds need a transformation, and that transformation comes through the Word of God. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Important to understand that. We are told, once again, we are uh, believers uh, are told that what's required that we have discernment and we get that discernment from God's word and we are to test the things, see whether they match up with God's word. This transformation process through the word of God will give us the ability to discern not only doctrinal error, error and that's important, it's a beginning spot, but it gives us discernment for every single area of our life. <clears throat> Peter says it this way in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue. All things, all that we need in every area of our life is through the knowledge of him that we have been given everything we need to live a Christian life in this fallen world. We don't need something else. God has equipped us with everything we need. But how do we have this knowledge of Christ? Well, it's through his word. In other words, just the Word of God. It's not our opinions. It's not our philosophies. It's not our feelings. That's the guide for true discernment. Let me repeat that. It is the Word of God. It's not our opinions. It's not our philosophies. It's not our feelings that are our guide. The Word of God is the true guide to true discernment. And growing in discernment then will bring maturity in our Christian walk. I want to refer to Ephesians uh, chapter 4. I'm going to read a few verses here, beginning with verse number 11. This is describing really how God has set things into motion, how he has established the church and, and the reasons for the different things that he's done and the uh, results of how this works. Now, these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church, the apostles and prophets, the establishment of the church, again, with the apostles and the prophets, and then the evangelists and pastors and teachers. 
Now that continues today with the evangelists and the pastors and teachers. So there's the, the teaching ministry, the, uh, the evangelizing, all that is God working among his people. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's sons, God's Son, that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. All right, so that's our goal. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about with every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Let's see, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 15. So a believer who's properly equipped and who's mature in the faith is no longer a child. He's not going to be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. But the truth is, an immature Christian is gullible. We really are. And today, in spite of unprecedented education and access to the Scripture, and even sound teaching, uh, you uh, can, if you, if you know who to look for, if you have some discernment in that area, but you can hear uh, good preachers, or you can uh, catch them on the radio, and, and even some on the television, I suppose, some of the uh, evangelists there are preaching the Word of God that... Um, you, can, you have access. You can go to a church that uh, pastors in the Word of God. That, that it's available to us. But even with all those things, it seems that just about any religious huckster who wants to has a ready hearing and he can get financial support from among God's people. And some of them are just uh, still today are in deceiving multitudes and multitudes of people with the false doctrine because Christians can be gullible when they have not matured in the area of discernment. One of the reasons there's so much false teaching being embraced, embraced as good, because it, just to be honest, there's a lot of biblical ignorance. Many who claim to have been Christians for years really know very little about the, what the Scripture actually teaches. They might know the basic stories of the Bible, but they really have not been in the Scripture and do not spend time many times reading the Scripture or even listening to it, they're satisfied with the little bit of knowledge they have. By the way, one of the favorite targets of the cults, such as the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses, is someone who has a background in faith, but still is very ignorant of the Word of God. Because a cultist um, will have a little common ground with them, and they will uh, mention the things they have in common, but they can just about tell them anything, and they will believe it, because they don't know the scripture well enough to recognize or to refute the error that are being taught. The second reason there's so much biblical ignorance is simply because many pastors don't preach the word. That's a tragedy. Their messages are geared more to making people feel good than they are to bringing God's message to a lost and dying world. God, or Paul has issued this challenge to a young preacher named Timothy. He says this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, encourage your people with good teaching. For the time is coming when people no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. Far too many have become more concerned about being accepted by the culture than by God. I'm afraid they become more concerned about being politically correct than being biblically correct. But God calls men to proclaim the gospel message and to teach the precepts of the Word of God. And to teach the Word of God is a task that must never be taken lightly. Remember when the this big shutdown happened last year, and all but the essential services were to be shut down. Of course, uh, churches were shut down as well, but talk about essential services. There's nothing more essential than really the proclaiming of the Word of God. There's nothing more important than teaching it correctly. Paul reminds Timothy of this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. He says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, 
rightly dividing the word of truth. Timothy, Paul's saying, it is absolutely vital that you divide the word, you preach it right. It's divided straight. It's done in the right way. Not only do pastors have a calling on their lives to proclaim the word of God faithfully, they also have an awesome responsibility to teach it carefully and accurately. James says this in James chapter 3, verse 1, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Uh, there are many people who like to start their own Bible studies and so on, and, and I appreciate the idea of people wanting to be in the Word of God, but when you set yourself up as a teacher, and people are looking to you for answers and direction, you have a very tremendous responsibility this is something that must be a, really a calling of God in that sense. And it must be a continual seeking of God's wisdom and, and the things that we say and promote. Never take the teaching of the Word of God lightly. But the ultimate test for discerning truth must be the Scripture. Whenever you're listening to preaching or reading what someone's written about Scripture, or maybe you're hearing someone give their opinion about biblical truth, need to examine it carefully, put it to the test. That's really what the verses we've been reading talk about. The test is always the scripture. A great example for us is uh, the Bereans uh, when they were first introduced to Paul's teachings. Paul had been in uh, Thessalonica and uh, there were many who were saved there in the brief time he was there, but the Jewish leaders rose up and got him kicked out of town. So just after being there a very short time, he then went to Berea and the Bible says, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether those things were so. So they heard Paul, by the way, Paul referenced the Old Testament. That's, it was the written word of God that was available and, and he would reference things and point to the fact that Jesus had fulfilled those. And so they, they took him up on that. They checked him out. They got the scriptures out and they checked to be sure that that's exactly what it was being said. They were more noble or fair-minded than the others because they took the time to really check it. The proper method of studying the scriptures is not to have a bunch of people sitting around and discussing a portion of scripture. Well, to me, this means this and uh, uh, I take from it that, that it means this and, and we have our own opinions and and sometimes those opinions vary drastically, but everyone's opinion seems to be given the equal status. So that's not the way to study the Word of God. The Word of God must be studied in the sense of, of what does it say? Now, there are applications. You may see something there and say, you know, that, that really applies to how I'm dealing with things in my family or how I should be, or uh, that's really a situation I'm finding at work. And there's certainly applications that we can see in the Scripture. So there's a sense that you might see a different application as someone else does. But there's not a different interpretation. The Scripture means what it says, and it says what it means. It's not based on what we want it to say, nor is it dependent on being culturally acceptable. Any study of the Scripture must be based on a careful study of what the Scripture is actually saying. What do those words mean? What do they mean? What, what is Paul implying here? What um, Really look at the historical uh, point in many cases. Where is he coming from when he says these things? Once again, we need to be reminded of Paul's instructions to Thessalonica, uh, the, the believers there. Back in Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21 and 22, we're to test all things, uh, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now the word test means to examine very carefully as if you're trying to reveal whether it's genuine or not. It's not just a, a quick examination. Say, well, it looks okay. It is a very serious examination. So we need to test something that we hear. See, how does that measure up? The, this is something that is subjected to scrutiny, to analysis. Okay, what is the scripture saying? Uh, here's the uh, person's interpretation of that. Does that really fit in with the scripture? Does it fit into the context here? And so on. There's some questions to ask. Sometimes this word is used really in uh, the testing of metals to determine the degrees of purity. That's where the word comes from. Test everything you hear to determine if it's true. 
And when you find it is, when you find it's good, then you cling to it. You hold on to it. Hold on to the truth. On the other hand, if it fails the test, you abstain from it. You don't kind of entertain it. Say, well, you know, maybe it's not exactly right, but it sounds nice and don't want to offend anybody. Literally, that word in the scripture, abstain, means to push it away from you. Have nothing to do with it. Get away from it. Don't listen to it. Don't allow it to influence your life. Evil is always presented in the scripture as something that's malignant, something that's harmful, corrupting, defiling, and influencing, injuring everything it touches. That's how it's referred to in the scripture. Evil is like a poison. It's like an infectious disease. Stay away from it like you'd stay away from the plague. Use your discernment. Learn what is pleasing to the Lord and then hold on to that. The sermon's a critical thing. That cannot be emphasized too much. How will and how you will serve the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be directly related to your discernment regarding the truth. Also, the joy of your Christian life is going to be directly related to your ability to discern because that's going to aid you to make good choices. There are many today who are basing their belief system on their experiences, their emotions, and in many cases, really a form of Christian mysticism without any real convictions based on the doctrines of Scripture. When that takes place, there's no standard by which to discern anything because there's no fixed point by which to measure anything. For example, the Bible teaches the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, when someone comes along and tries to tell me there's no such thing as a trinity, I know that what they're saying is a lie. I don't have to say, well, maybe there's a, a, some truth in what they're saying. If they're denying the biblical doctrine, I need to know, and I should reject it. Hold to the truth, cling to the truth, and push the, the lie away from me. The Bible teaches the deity of Jesus Christ. No question of that. He's the God-man. When a false teacher insists that Jesus is a created being, and this is one of the popular teachings of many cults, when, they, when you hear that, you know it's a false teaching. You don't have to wait around for anything else. Push it away. Avoid it. Get away from it. The Bible teaches justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. When someone says, I must do good works to earn salvation, well, right away I know there's a lie. It should push it away. Get away from it. Don't let it become an influence on me. I don't care who says it or who wrote it. If it contradicts what the scripture says, it's a lie. That is exercising discernment. Now, we might say, well, how do we do that? The spirit of love. And, and, and this is possible because uh, we don't always love the message, but we should have a compassion for those who are blinded by, uh, by these different false teachings. And our point is to love them to the point of telling them the truth. You don't really show love to someone when you allow them to remain in error and not try to show them what the biblical truth really is. To have discernment, we must first have a standard by which to measure truth. And that standard is the all-sufficient Word of God. I remember having a conversation several years ago with someone concerning the so-called Toronto, I think they called it the Toronto Blessing. It was part of movement. It was in different places across the United States and maybe in some different parts of the world. It was but a part of a movement in which people said they were filled with the Spirit of God. And when that took place, and they were teaching that everyone needed to aspire towards this. This is what every believer needed to go for. In fact, uh, the emphasis became was really focused on this the manifestations of the Spirit of God rather than really the simple gospel message that people need to be saved from their sins. But anyway, what would happen supposedly when people were filled with the Spirit of God, they would fall to the floor as if in a trance. And in the, the Toronto case, Toronto blessing, they would be stuck to the floor. And they often referred to that as being glued by the Spirit, to actually use that term. Others talked about being overcome with laughter, uncontrollable laughter. And, and others talked about being overcome with making 
different types of animal sounds. And they just totally out of their control. They would just begin to do this. And they said this was under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Well, in my conversation, I questioned these practices, the uh, being glued in the Spirit and uh, speaking or uh, uh, overcome with what they call the holy laughter or whatever. And because I couldn't find a reference in the Scripture that even remotely related to that. There was nothing gave any indication at all that that was a result of being controlled by the Spirit of God. My response, or the response I received through that was that I was putting God in a box. In other words, I was expected to accept any outrageous behavior as if it was from God simply because someone had experienced something and they claimed it was from God. Now that, my friend, is entering a very dangerous territory. To be honest, the behavior that was described to me sounds much more demonic than it does being from God. And discernment is extremely important. And that discernment rests upon the infallible and inerrant Word of God, which God has given us to guide us to truth. We're not to be left as if we're floating around in the ocean uh, on, a, on a raft someplace without uh, any ability to, to know where we're going or what we can do. That's not where the Christian is today. We have been given the guide, guidance that we need, and that is the Word of God. And we are to test. We are to measure up every claim, every experience, every teaching by the Word of God important that we do that. Let's practice discernment in our life because obviously it is, it is imperative to have a correct understanding of God and have a, a doctrinal purity when it comes to that. But that affects every single area of our life. How we live, our finances, our morals, everything that we do is affected by discernment. So my prayer is that you will begin uh, to even grow in this area of discernment and we will all reach that place of maturity where we will be able to discern when you hear something. You'll be able to say, you know what, there's something wrong. Doesn't, that doesn't mesh with the scripture. There's something wrong with that statement. And uh, we have the sermon and make us more effective in our walk and make us more effective in our testimony. Thank you for joining us tonight. And once again, we do encourage you, if you have a prayer request, uh, please let us know. Message us, uh, us there on Facebook or even send us a uh, private message on um, our church website. The church website is berlinfbc.com. We hope we can see you next week as we continue talking about discernment. And of course, we want to invite you to uh, tune in to our Sunday morning online service. It's at 9.30. And, uh, and we are going through the book of Nehemiah talking about vision. And uh, I think a very, very important thing in the Word of God, very encouraging to God's people. So our online service is at 9.30, of course, you're in our area. If you are able to attend in person, we'd love to see you. Our in-person service is also at 9.30. We'd welcome you to become part of that. Once again, thank you for being with us tonight. May God bless you. And how I pray that we would each be able to exercise true discernment in the things we face in our lives.